Han Shimakari. He is the founder of the International Rikyu Karate Research Society. Uh, he's a direct student of Richard Kim and Kim Shohiroshi Sensei. On a personal level, Han Shimakari was born in Vancouver. He is considered by us as a citizen of the world with a great experience in handling different cultures and regional perceptions. This allows him to bond with each of, it, uh, of us uh, in either a professional way and in a personal uh, point of view as we respected him and as a beloved person. Likewise, Han Shi is the author, translator okay. and interpreter of a dozen of books, papers and studies. Uh, we can mention among them the Bubishi, of course, uh, Classical Kata of Okinawa Karate, uh, Okinawan Greatest Masters, Mai Karate Jutsu, Tanpenju, uh, and the two volumes of the Ancient uh, Martial Arts of Okinawa. Anshi, it's a great honor to having yes. you at the forum today. I'm thankful once again to Kinjo Hiroshi Hosensei, uh, who always spoke to me about you with respect and affection. Osensei always said that I must learn from you to follow your experiences and enrich our karate with his, uh, your wisdom and knowledge. Uh, I am infinitely grateful for your presence here today. We are ready and happy to listen to you with all of our attention. Thank you very much, Hanshi. Please, we are ready to start your lecture today. Thank you. One else notice, Master Meatballs. Ninguém, Karate, ué, um abraço. My espanol is porquito. So I must respond in English. Uh, or to your colleague in uh, Japanese. <laughs> First of all, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I, I would like to begin by expressing my sincere gratitude for allowing me to visit with you. Thank you very much. It's also a, a great pleasure to make the acquaintance of new friends. And I'm sure we are all like-minded in pursuit of common goals. So I feel very comfortable uh, speaking with you and perhaps something that the viewers at home don't know is that we've had an opportunity to chat for 15 or 20 minutes before going live. So it's I'm very grateful to meet uh, some new friends. Thank you. Also, just before we start, I'd like to just make one tiny correction from my uh, uh, from your introduction. I wasn't actually born in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and I would be remiss not to mention this. I was actually born on the other coast of Canada. Vancouver is on the west coast. And I was actually born in a small uh, city on the east coast called St. John, New Brunswick. Vancouver was where I, that's no, not at all. I'm sure that's my fault somehow. But uh, Vancouver was where I was living in the 80s before I immigrated to Japan. When I, when I first left Canada for Japan in 1985, I was living in Vancouver. So may I um, ask, uh, in which direction would you like to begin uh, our talk today? Uh, would, would you like me to uh, target a specific uh, aspect or area to talk about? Would you like to ask questions or me to respond to? Uh, and and uh, 
um, I'm, I'm prepared to do anything, but I just like to know how, how you would like me to proceed. Uh, Sensei uh, Patrick Macari, I tried to explain me myself in English. Sorry, not a, a native English. I'm from Argentina. I've been uh, practicing uh, Shorin Ryu Shidokan for the last uh, 15 years. I'm also practicing Goju Ryu. Um, I, I can say that are kind of different styles. I love them both. But anyway, my question is the the I think uh, a question <coughs> related to bunkais, kata bunkai or analysis, whatever you want to call call it in, in Japanese or Spanish or, or English. Thing is, in your personal opinion, uh, those bunkais have been lost because of uh, of what exactly? This has been discussed so many times, but the, my, my, my question to you is, is because uh, senseis lost interest, really they lost it, or because they tried to do it just in a more practical teaching way? I, I believe, I'm sorry if there is any Shotokan practitioner here, but I believe uh, Shotokan school, they are kind of a culprit, I don't know the, the, the word in, in English, of uh, being those uh, bunkais lost, Uh, but I also cannot understand why Okinawan senseis couldn't, back in the past, introduce those bunkais to Japan. So I think there's kind of uh, neglected things in all the senseis, maybe for the 40s, I mean, 20th century senseis, or, or half 20th century, that they are kind of responsible for having lost those bunkais. Mauricio uh, sensei, First of all, thank you so much. That's a great question, and uh, I'm fully prepared to respond to it. But first, may I just say, I just discovered something new. I saw the little blue arrow, and I clicked on it, and it went to another screen, and I saw a, a bunch of my friends, Anselmo, Ahim, Vigues Bas Masters are good, not sure. Manuel, Robert Young, I'm coming to visit you in Florida. Christian Romanelli, Jeremy Allen, Francisco Barron, Gordy Reset, uh, Christine Ingham, Shane Carter. And then I saw another page and I flipped to that, and there's yet, there's so many people here. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, so grateful. Thank you so much for coming together. To this. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> I thought it was just us 10 guys. Uh, I'll try to do my best. I, I, uh, I can remember once uh, uh, speaking to a, a friend from England, and he was speaking to another friend. And uh, they said, oh, I just went to a Patrick McCarthy seminar. And the other guy said, did he talk you to death? <laughs> You know, the interesting part about the, uh, the lineage from which I come, it's that bumbu ryodo mentality, that it's not just uh, the physical, but it was also the academic or the scholarly, the, the approach to better understanding how we got here, why it is the way it is. And so, yes, I, I like to talk. But I also like to train. And that brings me to Mauricio's question about the bunkai. Okay. So, it is said that Budo, of which karate is an integral part, is a microcosm of the culture from which it comes a miniature representation of its uh, cultural landscape and social mindset. The reason why I mention this is in order to best understand how and why we are where we are today, it's important to understand how it happened in the first place. So I, I want to tell you this. And, and by the way, I, I, um, I, I hope it, I'm, 
I'm going to say, I hope I don't offend anyone with what I say, especially what I'm going to say right now. But allow me to say that what I tell you right now is about standing on the shoulders of these people. These are a group of uh, Japanologists, Japanese affectionados, cultural anthropologists, people who have had more than a passing fancy in Japanese culture. Erwin von Baelitz, uh, A.L. Sadler, Eugene Harrigal, Ruth Benedict, Douglas Herring, uh, Carfrey Graf Durkheim, uh, Joseph Campbell, my personal favorite of all the uh, Japanese, uh, of the, all the cultural anthropologists. Edwin Reichauer was the American ambassador to Japan for 20 years. George Kerr, uh, Okinawan uh, Island people. Uh, John Drager, uh, a personal mentor, uh, although he was never my teacher, I learned so much from him. Uh, Professor Chin uh, Shunzi, uh, who was uh, the cultural anthropologist in charge of the uh, Rikyu no Kaze that was being shot during the time I lived in Japan. They made a 42 part series on uh, NHK called uh, Rikyu no Kaze, all about the uh, 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 Okinawan culture. Um, Hokama Shuzen, professor of uh, uh, anthropology at uh, at uh, uh, Jose University, not to be confused with my friend, Hokama Tetsiro from Okinawa. Boy Lafayette, Dement, uh, Carl Van Wolveren, Tyra Koji. I have a very long, long list uh, of people who have made an enormous impact upon how I think about Japanese culture. So here's what I wanna say. Modern Japanese culture is built on a millennium of homogeneous, extremely discriminatory, male-dominated culture of conformity, which is nestled in a Confucian-based mindset, whose first tenet is filial piety which is a fancy word, which means uh, ancestor worship. Okay, so I'm not probably telling you anything new, but why this is important to understand is because we wonder why is this mindset locked in place? Well, why don't we think another way about what it is that brings us together? The reason for that is a mechanism in Japanese culture called the Senpai Kohai system. The Senpai Kohai system refers to imitative behavior from the seniors. The trickle-down effect perpetuates a mindset. And because there's no questioning of authority from the Confucian-based mindset, whatever a person passes on you don't question it. It is the way it is. It is the tradition. We have a lot of time, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, Mauricio, before I get exactly to your point. And by the way, the reason I speak like this is because of having spent more than a decade in Japan. I learned when you lecture <laughs> Japanese style, as opposed to Western style. Western style, I say, we're going to talk about something ask a question. 50 hands go up, I ask, I answer many questions. But Japanese culture, you're so well prepared, you give the dissertation, everybody goes, wow. I don't need to ask a question, I just heard it all. So this dichotomy that exists between East and West has provided a very, very fascinating phenomenon. Number one, we here in the West, we are not conformist. We're not, uh, we're not looking for uh, 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 a 
communal tranquility, if I can use Carl Van Wolveren's word when he described wa or peace and harmony in Japan, we're individuals. We, the yardstick we use to measure who we are in the West is the individuality, is the choice. So you ask a question about Bunkai. Why did they forget it? Did they know it at all? There's no historical documentation or testimony to elaborate what the definitive answer for that question is, if there was any in the first place. So I would like to lay out for you what I believe, because of my independent and individual research, has delivered. But let me conclude with the cultural part first. The point I made was Budo, of which karate is a part. There are many other parts to it as well. Kendo, Judo, Naginata Do, Shorin Jikempo, EI. These are all spokes on a larger wheel of Budo. And while the physical pathway we use to condition the body, cultivate the mind, and nurture the spirit might be different, the essence of where the journey is taking us is the same. And that's why we can say, although there are many pathways that lead up the mountain, there's only one truth. Karate. Since its arrival on the mainland of Japan in the late teens and early 1920s has been embraced as a tradition of percussive impact. You know, today, any kid can get on the internet at 10 years old and find a, a more about karate today than people did in the 1920s. But here's the thing. We are so passionate about the historical, technical, and tactical ambiguities of the past that we tend to stumble over contemporary assumption. Oh, that's just the way it is. They never knew it. I'd like to tell you this interesting story. The so-called art of percussive impact became popular largely due to the fact that Japanese people had never seen it before. They'd never seen it. I, I know that, doesn't that sound silly? What do you mean they haven't seen it? Everybody's seen it. Yeah, everybody today's seen it. But back in the 1910s and 20s, no. So, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that by by better understanding the culture from where the tradition comes, we learn more about the art. And by learning more about the art, so too do we learn more about the culture. But where the, where the problem exists is because the East and the West are so diametrically different in their mindset that we often make conclusions based upon misunderstanding. You know, the, I believe this, that if you're able to understand and study the anthropology of this tradition uh, that brings us together, it becomes evident sooner or later uh, that uh, many of these early pioneers of our traditions established a symbiosis with the art that their lives became as much a product of the art as the art became a product of their lives. I'm going to come back in just a moment and I'm going to talk to you about a gross uh, distortion of a few parts of Japanese culture that had an enormous impact upon the fighting arts. But, but first I'm gonna, I, I wanna, I, I was talking to you about 1921, 
before uh, I asked uh, Gabriel Sun to make the translation. 1921 is a hugely influential uh, year for karate. I want to tell you for two reasons. First, from about, from about the very uh, closing years of the 19th century until the very, very early dawn of the 20th century, uh, military in Okinawa, uh, Ryukyu, they called in those days, still, uh, even though it was a prefecture uh, belonging to uh, Kagushi, uh, uh, to Kyushu at the time. Um, the Minister of Education there uh, had a, a large influence over uh, the educational system on, uh, on the island. And because of this, karate became known, the, the, the word karate. And uh, some, some naval uh, 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 personnel uh, became interested in the art. And now it didn't go very far, but it did cause a, a large interest in, in what we're talking about and what brings us together. So, so why I mentioned the Navy is because jump ahead now to 1921. And in March, it's a long story. Read my book, Tom Penshu. Um, but the crown prince, uh, the emperor's son, was going to do something that no other Japanese had ever done. Uh, no other Japanese from the royal family had ever done. And he was going to go to Europe. That's a conversation for another time. But the point being is the, the people responsible for mentoring that child young man and you say saging he was coming up to the uh you know the, the age of uh, what we, you become an adult in japan and um, and then he you know uh, how to get him to europe uh who's going to protect him and so on but anyway i'll just give you the reader's digest version quickly to make this point the americans and the british with japanese money built the, the best battleships on the planet Earth at that time. It was called the Kashima and the Katori. <laughs> All my friends who practice uh, Koryu, uh, Kenjitsu, you know that's like Kashima Shintoru, Tsukahara Bokuden, <laughs> and Tenshin Shorin Katori Shintoru, my school of soldiers. Katori, Kashima. So these two battleships together were going to sail the Crown Prince over to Europe. Now, in those days, to get there, you've got to sail south and come around. So you're going to pass, you know, you're going to leave out through Yokohama and go down south past all the islands, past the Ryukyu Archipelago, all the way around, you see? Well, isn't it interesting that one of the naval officers, who became a very famous admiral later, was one of the people in charge of mentoring Hirohito, uh, the crown prince of that time. And this was the same guy who put in a good word for a young Okinawan boy who had been adopted by a Japanese military family and had become a bright young captain in the Japanese Navy. And can you imagine this, the honor that he would bring back to Okinawa? His name was Kana Kenwa. And Kanakenma became the commander of the fleet sailing the crown prince, the emperor, the, the Showa emperor, out to Europe. Now, I wasn't privy for the conversations back and forth, but Kanakenma's life story has been written. And so I had access to read that. And I found out some, some wonderful things. But the point being here is this, and why I'm making such a point of this, you'll see in a moment. They say, well, you know something, we're going right by Okinawa, why don't we stop in and have a sandwich? Great idea. They say the, uh, the uh, population of Okinawa in those days was uh, several hundred thousand people, you know, not, you know, not, not a lot. 600,000 Okinawans 
came out to greet the emperor and the emperor's captain as they came to Okinawa. And in addition to all the many things that they did while they were there, they made the long five kilometer journey from the dock up to Shirinojo, uh, Shuri Castle. There's an interesting story about how they selected the rickshaw pullers. That's another story for another time. <laughs> Remind me to ask me about Onara. Mohammed, Onara. Onara. Anyway, that, that's another story. But they finally got him up there and he watched a karate demonstration. They took photographs, uh, they asked questions. It was a wonderful thing. And we, we now know, of course, Funagoshi Dichin and his uh, group of students were the people to present the demonstration. Yes? March 21. Okay. Time out. On the other side of the coast right here in the United States, also in the same month, 1921, a boxing match was going on. Boxing. It featured Jack Dempsey and En Francais, George Carpenter. George Carpenter was a top 10 world rated boxer of that era. He was also a Sabat competitive champion as well. And they were brought together in New Jersey for the world championships. So you're asking me now, what, what has this got to do with karate? Marcia, I'm getting to you. That boxing match was a phenomenon. It was the first time in the history of pugilism that they generated a million dollar gate. Oh my goodness, there are photographs you can see of the masses of people gathering, the throngs of people. There was a blimp in the air, like a, you know, like a film, film footage of that, like Cathay Pacific. They, they filmed it. A Dempsey, just as a matter of interest, knocked out Carpenter in the fourth round, heavy blows. He wasn't doing good in the fight up to there, by the way, but he wins the fight. Okay. The film of that fight played in Tokyo in June. Wow, a lot of discussions. Now remember, this is the 1920s. In English, we have a term we call the Roaring Twenties. The world was a stage, came alive with uh, entertainment, music, film, art. It, it, a wonderful time. As you know, the Japanese, who had just literally dragged themselves out from the dark ages of feudalism only 50 years before, were now sitting on the world stage as, as, a, as a world power and demonstrating to the world industry, culture, technology, and so on. They love Western sports. Uh, Mohammed will tell you, go to Japan. Uh, Western sports are huge. Baseball is a, a phenomenon, far more popular than karate, by the way. But the Japanese had never seen boxing before. They saw it and they said, we want that too. Dempsey didn't want to go to Japan. No way. A guy by the name of Sasaki Gogai answered the questions on the mind of the Japanese people who wanted boxing. He said in his November 1921 article, he said, we don't, we don't have to, we don't need that. We have that already in our culture. Why? To the island kingdom in the South Seas, we have a fistic tradition called karate. And he describes it. I'm, I'm reading Funagoshi's work a long time ago, when I'm, I'm uh, his 1920, uh, 1922 uh, Ryukyu Kempo uh, karate. And uh, in the back of it, he makes a he makes a comment about 
an article he read in November last year. I thought to myself, November last year. He's only been in, he only came at the end of April or May, around May, around May, May 5th or 6th, he only arrived. So what article is he talking about? Oh, National Diet Library, looking, looking, looking. I couldn't find it. I asked all of my colleagues, they couldn't find it. Finally, a dear friend of mine and a, a long uh, standing member of our group named Joe Swift, he found it and, and he gave it to me. Thank, uh, thank you, Joe. That article, I translated and I put it into the book, Tom Panchu, to explain this. Here's two things. You've got, because of the 1921 demonstration of karate in Okinawa, and the phenomenon that boxing made for the Japanese desire to want it, created the desire to get it up onto the mainland. Dempsey didn't want to come, like a lot of other foreigners, uh, British, French, Russian, Prussian, uh, came to Japan to teach everything you can possibly imagine. But it was Funagoshi that was introduced, that came up from the mainland. Now, were there other, were there other Okinawans? Absolutely. In, in fact, before Funagoshi, we know, uh, multiple Choki was there. We, we know that already. We know what that uh, Gima Shinken came because we know that after the demonstration in uh, uh, May of 1922 for the uh, National Athletic Exhibition, we know that Gima Shinken then that, uh, uh, acted as a, as a uh, the Kohai to Funagoshi Sensei to give a demonstration uh, at the Kodokan with uh, Kanoji Goro Sensei. We know that. We know that uh, in 1928, we know that Miyagi and Mabuni came. We know that uh, Toyama Kanken, uh, Uechi Kanbun, uh, uh, Chitose Tsuyoshi, we know these other people came up as well. But at that time, the focus of attention was on Funabushi Michi. So, okay, that's the point I wanted to make. Now let's go back. At that time in Japanese culture, we refer now to it as a period, in spite of the wonderful, uh, the wonderfully blossomed culture in which it became, coming from feudalism into becoming a world power was nothing short of amazing. But a term that we attach to that now is that Japan, that era was uh, during a, a, a radical period of military escalation. And during that time, and this was during the time where the foreign minister of affairs was a guy named Inoue Kaoru. Inoue Kaoru. Some of you may recognize the surname Inoue, because this is the great grandfather of Inoue Motokatsu from the Ryukyu Kobujitsu Hozon Shinko Kai. And I had some personal insight to study him during the years in Japan because of Motokatsu Sensei. During his time, three parts of Japanese culture remained intact. Even though the Japanese were liberally bringing in to their culture many Western concepts, sports, industry, technology, education, uh, clothing, hairstyles, okay? But three, three parts that were never to change were this. The first one was called Shushin. Shushin. Mohammed, so ni imi wakarimashita ga Shushin. Chotto muzukashii desu kedemo yabare ne. Shushin means, uh, what does it mean? Shushin means, <laughs> it means, um, um, I want to say, uh, I wanted to say reverence to the emperor, but it's more than that. It's worshiping uh, the emperor as if he was God, not, not, not a son of God, not a, but God, blindly worshiping the emperor as God. And number two was called Koktai Hongi, Koktai Hongi. Actually, it's probably better described for other cultural anthropologists as Meiji Jidai no Koktai Hongi. And this means national polity. 
And there's a lot of ways to describe what national polity is. I myself prefer Karl van Wolveren's definition in his uh, wonderful work called The Enigma of Japanese Power, a book that was banned in Japan, by the way, at the time. 500 pages of remarkable insight, where he describes wa, uh, this, uh, uh, this, the nature of Japanese culture, you know, this, this, uh, uh, this is somewhere that lies between Tatemai and Onnei, this wonderfully peaceful and harmonious uh, essence of the culture. He describes wa as the manipulative power of the Japanese government to distort certain parts, especially of its uh, uh, spiritual beliefs, to place personal desire behind communal tranquility. And the third part, rarely talked about, is a term called Nihonji Ron, Nihonji Ron, which means the uniqueness of we Japanese people. So these three areas were brought together. There were five ministries at the time, but governments, Mombusho, a lot of these people getting together, working in conjunction with the Dainipon Butokukai, established in 1895 as the single group to oversee the fighting arts in Japan. At that time, there, today we have a, a very clear distinction of what the fighting arts are. We have Bujutsu, Buge, and Budo. Uh, the, the previous two are we, we refer to as uh, Kogyu. Uh, the latter is referred to as a Gendai or, or a Shinburo. Or if you mix and match, sometimes we call them Sogoburo. But in those days, the idea of bringing the fighting arts out from behind the closed doors of obscurity was based, we believe, on the concept of a German. Uh, I know Achim, I know you know who I will be talking about. The name of Kaffrey Graf Durkheim comes up. And we know that at this time, uh, that the idea of consolidating the concepts of using the sword uh, in, a, in an idea brought together by uh, an empty-handed practitioner, uh, influential person, an aristocrat, ironically with not much hands-on experience, less than five years, but known as an educator, the only, the only Japanese member of the International Olympic Committee, decides to modify the practice of old school jujitsu and using this German idea this Tolner's idea of, of, you know, gymnastics and wrestling and swordsmanship to be put into the school system, the idea of using the fighting arts became a mechanism through which to funnel physical fitness and social conformity in support of the war machine during this period of radical military escalation. Now, Mauricio, I'm so sorry. It took a long time to get to this, and that's that was a that's a that is a, to say that that's a synopsis is an understatement. I wish we could talk about this all day. I'm so used to delivering this lecture in college, uh, where I had uh, 14 weeks in one semester uh, on the anthropology of the culture. Here we had what 14 minutes or 40 minutes. So knowing this is going on in Japan at the, at the time. We now look back to at Okinawa at that time was, a, was, was a, its economy had been dilapidated. It, it, the, the, the treasury had been methodically bled dry from 1609. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's one for another story altogether. I, I'd love to talk about that. That would be a great conversation. One day, okay? But what you have by the mid 1800s is you have an economy that's 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 falling apart. Uh, you have a, a famine. You have, you have a food shortages. Uh, if you were a young man growing up in Okinawa, your goal would be to leave the island. If you were a young lady growing up, your 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 goal would be to find a husband and settle down and have a family. 
And, and, that, and these are areas that are rarely, if ever, talked about, by the way. But it goes back to the point of knowing something about the culture helps you better understand more about the art itself. So at this time, and I know that Itoso Uncle gets all the credit for this, but it wasn't just Itoso Uncle. You know, it's like when somebody puts on something like, like this, uh, this gathering today. You know, I know that the uh, Shihan Pimatal and the and Gabriel are, but I bet there's many people behind getting this thing to work. When Itosu Uncle modified the practice of these larger Chinese-based uh, solo drills, he didn't do it by himself. There, there's a collective group of people behind his effort to get these into the school system in the same way that Juno and Kendo had been put into the school system. Uh, very subjective issue here, very abstract, but maybe from the German physician at Tokyo University, who was also the private and personal physician for the, for the sickly Taisho emperor, who said, you know, we're having a problem in boot camp trying to train soldiers. Uh, what's the movie? Uh, Last Samurai. You know, uh, 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 Tom Cruise says, here, shoot me. And the kid's so nervous, he can't even shoot him at point blank. Uh, and the, the issue was that the, uh, you remember uh, when Japan made the transition from feudalism into, uh, into, its, uh, uh, into the Meiji Restoration, there were no more samurai. The, top, the chomage came off, the double swords, the stipend from the government. A lot of things changed. And, and, and education was a monopoly of people of wealth and position in that era, not peasants. And now you have people with no education coming into the military. And there's stories about that. We, we know about Hanushi Ochomo and uh, Yabukens, the sergeant, actually, the lieutenant, but, and, uh, and uh, another person never got much recognition about uh, the impression they made on the medical exams uh, when they were going for a conscription. So the interest of Itosu modifying one part of a larger whole developed solo routines to be used for the lack of a better word, Meiji period Taibo. They were used as group exercises as an adjunct to physical fitness, uh, calisthenic type exercises in the school system. Now that it caught on and became a phenomenon was a surprise. Uh, my teacher and our teacher, Mr. Himatel's teacher, Kinji Hiroshi, born 1919, sadly passed away uh, in his 90s, uh, 2013. He said to me many times, nobody, nobody, nobody was more surprised that karate ever became anything than the Okinawan people themselves. It was a phenomenon. And so when the issue gets up onto the mainland of Japan, the Japanese don't need weapons. They have the sword. You put the sai against the sword, I'm going with the sword. They, they didn't need the tegumi, uh, you know, uh, this idea of wrestling, uh, grappling, which now is, now is a cultural phenomenon, you know, uh, they have all kinds of rules and regulations. Back back in the day, back in the day, Tegumi was a pretty brutal form of form of clinch grappling. You know, uh, uh, there was um, Torite, which we now know traces its uh, roots back to chinat seizing and uh, controlling joint lock, pressure point takedown, strangulation, throw grappling, groundwork, all of the limb uh, manipulation. Uh, uh, and uh, balance displacement, uh, escapes encounters, that all has to do with Torite, used by law enforcement and the military, of course. A Tigua, Tigua, uh, uh, which is, uh, I, George Kerr describes Tigua, you know, as this form of percussive. One word comes from Siam. <laughs> no big history there. Well, you know, when you, when you look around the surrounding cultures, and conduct your cross-comparative research and analyses. You know, you, you, it's like you can shake an apple tree all day long. Oranges are not going to fall out of it. When you look around China, Korea, 
Southeast Asia. And to find a tradition that uses the fists and the feet, it's not Chinese Kung Fu. Kung, uh, Taekwondo comes, it's not even in the same ballpark. It's modern like karate, which in fact, that's another story. Only one culture did that. And that was Siam, 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 the kingdom of Siam, which in 1949 became Muay Thai, uh, which became, sorry, Thailand. And we now know that form of fighting to become Muay Thai. But uh, you know that a lot of people are going to say, oh my God, are you telling me that uh, Muay Thai is Tigua? Yes, I am. That's exactly what I'm telling you. But in the same way that pugilism became boxing, so too did this Muay Baran become Muay Thai. And that's another story. Please, let's talk about that one day. I'd love to show you the evolution of it. And you know, in those days, they used to call it the big nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those are tools of percussive impact. That is what T was. And I know everybody else has their own theory. That's mine, okay? And finally, the fourth, empty-handed practice. Once, very extent, during the Okinawa's old Rukyu Kingdom period, is kata. That is what was introduced to the mainland of Japan. And once again, because of the enormous influence and weight of Budo culture under the hand of the Dainipon Butobukai, the Okinawans had to make a lot of changes. One of the wonderful gifts that can be uh, bestowed in learning the art is to come into contact with a source that can reveal the history of this tradition, this art. And I was very lucky early in my career to meet uh, one of Kinjo Sensei's students, Richard Kim, who taught me the value of on ko chi shin. On ko chi shin, as most everybody here knows. That just basically means um, to, if you study the origins of the past or something old, you can better understand uh, why it is the way it is or the, the new version of it. The beautiful part about studying what happens in between is you come into contact with what cultural or anthropological forces uh, affected its growth and direction. There's a lot of myth and mysticism surrounding what is really true in this tradition. And, and Mauricio, when I answered, when I first started on this marathon answer, which I don't apologize for, by the way, these things need to be talked about. From space culture. There's nobody ever questions, you know, uh, somebody down here never questions anybody up there. That is in from a Western and a, a, and a researcher or a scientific point of view is a no, no for us. You know, most of us here, and I would probably say all of us here have died. We have one thing in common, irrespective of the different uh, uh, parts of the world that we come from, we're Western. We're Western-based thinkers. Our best friends, when trying to unearth the truth, are uh, seven, seven people. Six of their names begin with W, and one guy's name begins with H. And you know what I mean. When, why, which, where, who, how. That is how we penetrate the veil of ambiguity that tends to shroud what is otherwise a pretty, pretty simple tradition to understand. But I found in the Western culture, too many of us want to place people up on a pedestal beyond reproach. You can't, you can't ask the master that, it's not, it's not welcome. So, you know, if you're one of those people who do question authority 
in Japanese culture, well, I learned very quickly living in Japan, a metaphor I'd like to share with you. Deru kui wa utareru. Or, or you can also say deru kugi. Kui ka kui. Kui ka kugi. It's one or the other. Kui means peg, like not a nail, but a peg. And kugi means nail. Deru kui wa utareru means this that the protruding nail gets pounded down. Metaphorically speaking, in Japanese culture, if you are that nail sticking up, you're going to get pushed back down again. And if you don't stay down, then you're going to get plucked out. And in the old days, they used to use this Japanese term, murahachibu. That means to be ostracized, but it carries more weight than just being, oh, we're not going to talk to him anymore. It's like, you might as well go commit suicide now and your family, because what you did has embarrassed, I like to say, threatened the insecurities, but that's another question. I'm already on, I'm already on, I'm already on <laughs> weak ground right now here from a cultural point of view. But here's the point. So, Marisa, I'm coming back to you now. So, there's a, the, uh, Marisa, the, the one part of a larger whole. The larger whole represent, with, with empty hands, not weapons, is tegumi, tegwa, or tigwa, tigwa. Torite and Kata. These are the four parts. One part, Kata, which in my opinion was never meant to teach you anything. It was meant to culminate what you should have already learned in a two-person scenario-driven practice, which when you separate it, the application practice, when linked together with other such practices into some type of uh, abstract or subjective uh, geometry, creates something greater than the sum total of its individual parts. And that is what kata is. It was meant originally to contain and culminate how you responded to those acts of physical violence that were or are habitual in human nature and specifically to that society. When I say that society, I specifically mean Southern China and exclusively Fujian province, which is where we trace our uh, progenitor sources from which comes the kata of karate. So leave that for a moment. When Itosu and the others modified this practice to put it in to, and it wasn't just the school system. They tried it in the military. The Navy guys tried it. They tried it in the police department, uh, but it's just that when it get into the school system, that was the key. Children went to school only for five years in those days. Uh, and look, I mean, they were not practicing kata every day. Uh, you know, the, this was an adjunct to their daily exercise. Ask, ask any Japanese person, uh, especially the older people, uh, what is this? And I'm going to use the I'm going to use the Japanese pronunciation here. Dadio taiso, dadio taiso, dadio means radio taiso. For about the last 100, well, as soon as as soon as radios were invented and used in Japan, every morning, when Japanese culture wakes up and they got this dozen sets of exercises that they do. So the idea 
of uh, this communal tranquility coming together. It was already ingrained in, at that era. And, and this very nationalistic sense of pride, plus the propaganda, distorted propaganda of the fighting arts, uh, that's how you become a real man and serve the government. Uh, this propaganda uh, about, you know, uh, you might not have come from samurai stock, but by practicing the fighting arts, you will in, imbue the spirit of those samurai warriors. Was was a very common propaganda used by the by uh, uh, the Batokodai of that era of that radical period of military escalation. And now all of a sudden, think about it, Mauricio. In judo, you know, you learn the uh, you know you learn the uh, the uh, ukemewaza. You know how to protect yourself from falling. You learn the, you know, the uchikomi, how to, how to step in to set up a throw, three parts of every technique, you know, the set up, the entry and the execution. Uh, and then uh, what did you do? You, you did the randori, you know, that was the gift at the end was, you got all the basics and now you do the, you do the fighting. That worked well for guys in school, fantastic. Kendo, you learn, it's very simple, four strikes. Men, ski, do, and kote. Four strikes. Then you learn the, the sabaki, you know how you move. You put on the ro yo, yo roi, and what do you do? You fight. But here's the thing I talk about. We were all very, very uh, passionate about wanting to study the historical uh, 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 tactical and technical ambiguities of this art, but we 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 stumble over contemporary assumption because we don't know the actual history of the art, and that's why it's so important. When when karate was brought up to the well, sorry, sorry sorry when kata was brought from Okinawa to the mainland of Japan, it caused a phenomenon. Nobody ever seen it before. They saw the, you know, the boxing. They figured, let's let's do it. And of course, like all the other fighting arts, there's secret practices. You have to spend many years learning how to, you know, master it. But what you did was, see, today you think, oh, well, you'll learn a kihon first. You know, then you maybe uh, you, you maybe do some one or two step uh, uh, yakusoku kumite. Uh, and then you go to Kumite. No, 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 no. That's not part of Okinawan Karate. Never was, ever. Kihon Waza was developed in the 1920s. Yakusok Kumite came from the 1920s, 19, early 30s. Karate became a tradition in December of 1933 through the Dainipon Batoka after they met the expectations of the Dainapon Batokai, get rid of the Chinese uh, ideogram, uh, get rid of the jutsu, bring it in and practice the michi, the do, the, you know, the same pathway that kendo Jiu, everybody else is practicing, you know, adopt the standard training uniform, use Kano Jigoro's Dan Q system uh, with OB, uh, and finally, like kendo and judo, create a platform upon which to test your, your fighting skills, and your Yamato Damashi, your fighting spirit. That's when karate became what it is that we know today. In those days, in the teens and the early 1920s, Funagoshi was teaching, follow me. He stood there and went one, two, three, four, and everybody behind him followed him. Now, he didn't stop halfway through and said, no, 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 you got to do this. No, 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 You followed him. You didn't ask any questions. And they went from the cut from the beginning to the end. Over and over and over and over. Let me just, I got five more overs. Okay? Over and over and over. And that was it. There wasn't any climax at the end. You didn't get like Kendo and Judo to fight and spar at the end. They didn't do it. In fact, Funagoshi made a big deal out of it. I'm not knocking Funagoshi. Please, please, if anybody out there thinks I'm knocking somebody, I'm not. That's why I lean on the shoulders of the anthropologists. That's why I studied all of the historical phenomena as much as I could. 
And in spite of what some people think, I believe by looking back, we can see further ahead. So, Mauricio, sorry. Why isn't there any Bunkai Jitsu? And that's a new word too, by the way. That, that's a word out of Japanese grammatical, uh, uh, Japanese grammar. How to break down the grammatical compositions of a word, which was adopted by the Kendo people who were looking to figure out what the hell do these moves mean? The analyses of something. Let's we'll leave that for a minute, okay? When you practice something for a reason other than what it was originally meant to do, we saw the brutality of these practices fall quietly dormant during the mid-1800s. And then, and then here's a part that uh, I noticed not, not a lot of people talk about. From about the time of the Opium Wars in 1840 up till the time of the Boxer Rebellion in, uh, in 1900, there's a period of about uh, uh, 50, 60 years. Maybe we'll use this for another conversation. Please, please invite me back. We'll talk about that or whatever you like another time. But a lot of things happened during that time. Most of them had to do with foreigners in China exploiting the Chinese for drugs. Uh, you know, uh, for Chinese uh, uh, goods, let's say that, okay. You know, silk and gem, uh, semi-precious gems and, and uh, ivory and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, art and uh, dope. And, uh, and uh, believe me, big time opium, uh, big deal. You know, opium wars, for God's sake, you know. And you know, you know what was it? You know what the Chinese had in those days? They had black powder muskets that, uh, th that were not even supersonic, they were subsonic. And that means sometimes if it wasn't a good load, the bullet hit you, it probably wouldn't even penetrate your body. And if you had armor on, there's a good chance uh, that it wouldn't penetrate you at all. Now, I'm not saying that a lot of them did. But the foreigners had with them Winchesters, supersonic. Uh, that, that means they have a projectile coming out of a cylinder that's traveling faster than the speed of sound. And they were just knocking them over like ducks. And anyway, the point is this. You could practice the boxers were the martial arts security people, right? You could, you could practice the martial arts your whole life. And, 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 and many did. And, and be remarkably talented, great guys. You gotta remember during that, that the fall of the Manchu government there at that time, a lot of, that's all, that we can do a whole movie just on that alone, okay? You've got all of these, the crumbling of the, the corruption was terrible. So you've got guys who used to be soldiers running around the countryside in little, little cliques, you know, little militias. And in order to make money, they're giving demonstrations in the city center on a stage. We're doing a sword cut. Uh, I'm doing a, this guy is going to chop a ceramic jar in half. Oh, this guy's gonna lay on a board of nails. Oh, this guy's gonna, he's got a, he's got a sword in his throat. He can chop a watermelon off his stomach. Oh, people who didn't understand the science behind it would go, oh, oh my God, that's remarkable. Yes, sir. And the people would throw coins up on the stage uh, to encourage them to demonstrate more and more and more. And, 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 and if they ran out of things to show, they just made them up. I, I kind of laughed the other day, I was watching one of my students, Jesse Enkamp, uh, figured out a way with which to deliver how Wei Chi Ru created four katas. <laughs> Go watch Jesse's, he's got a, he made up a whole thing for 20 minutes just to show one point, uh, that, that Wei Chi Ru created four katas to make money doing demonstrations back on the day. It happens all the time. We just don't hear about it. Or if you do hear about it, nobody wants to know because it threatens shame in a tradition that's not supposed to be. The katas are supposed to come from God, uh, you know, Mount Sinai, for example, right? So anyway, here's the point is the kata was not practiced for its combative purpose, ever. It was practiced as a mechanism to encourage physical fitness and social conformity. So when the boys went into the military, they were tremendously fit and not so much in the noggin. 
And that way they carried out the commands of the superiors and everything. It's only in the post-war years. And really, to tell you the truth, I mean, I started practicing karate in the 1960s. And by the 1960s and 1970s, nobody ever talked about what, what, what does this move mean? Nobody ever talked about that. It's only now in the last 25, 30, 40 years. And, and, and I'm going to tell you how bad it is. You got people out there going, well, the meaning of that move is I go like this, I go like this, I go like this, I think, boom, and I knock him unconscious. And people believe it. They're believing it. That's how far removed from the simplistic aspect, two things. Percussive impact is one. And number two is seizing. And I'm going to let Gabriel explain that. And then I'm going to come back and I will conclude my talk with the applications. And might to repeat these last two concepts again. Yeah, sorry. So all roads in self-defense, one against one, in acts of physical violence that are empty-handed, in domestic society, so I'm not talking about the battlefield, I'm not talking about the arena, they're basically the same anyway, different rules and regulations. I'm not talking about weapons. I'm not talking about a melee, a, a group, group violence, multiple attackers, just domestic self-defense. This is self-protection. I'm going to talk about what we're doing is not a martial art either, by the way. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a civilian method of defending and protecting yourself. We'll say that. I've already, I'm already way out on a limb. I'll just take it easy there. And I said, everything's got to do with two phenomenons. Percussive impact. That's the transfer of kinetic energy with a limb against an anatomical structure, a target. And number two, seizing. Whether you seize with your hands, whether you seize with your arm, whether I seize with my legs, or whether I seize with my teeth. The mechanism the, 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 the contractive mechanism is the same. And the principles that support the transfer energy are immutable. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about science, how it hasn't changed from 500 years ago. If you were a, a monk in the Shaolin Monastery, or you're living in that beautiful place called Santa Fe, Argentina. This is a classical case of reverse influence. The art originally came from Okinawa to the mainland of Japan during a period of radical military escalation. And their idea was not to embrace the art for its functionality, but rather as a mechanism to adjunct the method of physical fitness and social conformity used in the school system. Then the Japanese, specifically two people, both originally students of Funakoshi Gichin, then later would turn their attention to Motobu Choki and uh, had a casual uh, teacher-student relationship also with Mabuni Kenwa was Konishi Yasuhiro and Otsuka uh, Hironori. I wanted to say Tadehiko, but that's Goju Kencha. So Konishi and Otsuka were the two driving forces behind creating Kihonwaza constructing the platform upon which 3K style training evolved from. That's going to cause a little bit of controversy for everybody. Thank you very much. Happy to talk about that anytime.
facts, details, science. And, and sadly, sadly, Konishi Yasuhiro, who in, who in my opinion was such a, a, a principal force behind this, is almost unknown. Nobody knows who he is. Uh, Shindo Jinenju, Yobukai. This guy, okay, that's that, for another story. We'll come back and talk about the marvelous things he and Otsuka did together. But reverse influence. So now, Japanese karate becomes very popular on the mainland of Japan. Post war years, you can't practice any martial art. Dying upon Batokakai is shut down. General Douglas MacArthur takes the Allied forces establishes GHQ in the Kyoto Butoku then, at insult to injury, by the way. And then gradually, the mindset for embracing Budo changes. Because before, we saw it as this ultra-nationalistic mechanism to help indoctrinate young people to support the war machine during a radical period of military escalation. It is seen as the roots of militarism in Japan, Japanese culture. You know, the Allied forces uh, in the post-war years, they don't want to continue to cultivate that mindset. They don't have enough problems. But when it becomes evident that the fighting arts, judo, kendo, aikido, and, and not just that, but sado, uh, tea ceremony, and uh, shodo, you know, and uh, uh, flower arrangement. Lo, lo, there are lots of practices here, all, all embraced by samurai, by the way. You know, this is not a girl's thing. This is by everybody, does, you know, uh, and uh, becomes a pathway. It's embraced in, and nowhere is this practice more embraced than with the foreign people visiting Japanese culture? It becomes a pathway to better understand the culture. Hence the term. Budo becomes a microcosm for Japanese culture. But now keep in mind the two dominant Budo in Japan were Kendo and Judo. And Kendo and Jiro, uh, the, the dominant Budo of, of the era, have a, have a, a, a very clean-cut uh, pedagogical pathway. You know, Kihon, uh, uh, Kata, Randori, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, as I described earlier. So karate is forged in the identical image of these two other arts. You know, so, so, so I, I can't take a sword and kill you to show you that it works. I have to theorize. Unlike Jiro, where I can throw you and you can resist and then we fight and then technique becomes, well, used to become. Now it's, you know, another story. So technique is everything. So now somebody says, well, what does a, you know, what does a Yakuzuki or, you know, what, what does, what does, the, what, 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 what? So this is where, Mauricio, this is where you get the bunkai. This is where you get one person saying, oh, this means this. Go ahead, attack me. Not too fast. Attack me. So, so, so from the beginning, it's fraught with inconsistencies. Number one, it doesn't really represent an act of physical violence that would example what would happen in the street or in an, in a, in an, in an act of violence, uh, home invasion or being attacked at an ATM. It doesn't do that. I know ahead of time, you're gonna hit me in the chin, or, but you know, with a, with a, and I'm going to do something and, and everybody can, Today they theorize about it, and it's just not, it's like in kendo. I, I I attack you with the men, you know, Joda, you know, I, I and I come down and you know I do skuyuke and you know then I attack you kote or something and I give a ki I woo and I we keep the zan shin and then we come back. That's what they do in kendo to demonstrate. That's what they do in karate, and it became an accepted practice to do that. 
Everybody else in the Western world was saying, okay, I'm going to believe that like for five minutes. And after a while, I'm not believing that anymore. And it, because that just doesn't work. So this is where this myth and mythology, don't ask any questions. Uh, um, Who are you to question the master? And, and you know, and if you did, you, you know, you were bringing shame upon your tradition. The last time I looked, tradition was not about blindly following in the footsteps of somebody holding the ashes in a box of the dead master from 200 years ago. I love Matsuo Basho's quote about tradition. It's to continue seeking out that which the pioneers were seeking. It was about keeping the flame or the spirit of this pursuit. Joseph Campbell, my favorite anthropologist. Every generation produces people who, in an effort to keep their uh, traditions a living experience for the community that they serve, find reason with which to reinterpret the common principles upon which it rests. And in doing so, and in spite of the lip service page of this is better than that, it becomes more innovative ways of doing the same thing and obtaining the same outcome. Oh, my style's better than yours. I struggled with this for so long. You know, I, I, I've taught karate in more than 65 countries around the world for over a thousand seminars in, in more than 35 years. And I can tell you, I used to see it everywhere. How can I overcome this narrow mindset? So I came up with an idea. Okay, how about this? You know, one style is supposed to be better than another. So how about this? I get all the styles together. You know, in back in the old days, you said big sound, you know, 100, 150 black belts. That was very common. These days, not so much, but anyway. So I always take one guy, usually the guy who, who talked a lot, you know, the coochie bushy, you know, and I'd say, I, may I use you uh, as the, you know, the center here? Yes, we won't hurt you. And then I would ask a guy, oh, anybody from Shoto? Shito, Goju, uh, Weichi, uh, Shorin, Ishinru, any style. And I would bring them up. And some guys from Jiu Jitsu or Aikido or Taekwondo, I don't care. And I would say, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to go over and give a little, you know, you're going to give a punch or somebody's going to give a chop or you're going to bite somebody or you throw somebody or you don't hurt them. But I just want them to feel that because they're going to be blindfolded. They're not going to be able to visually see you. Oh, oh that show the camera. And I'm going to ask them not to talk so they don't hear your voice. And I'm going to make sure that you, you know, they're not going to hurt you. Are you prepared? Yes, I'm prepared. So I put the blindfold on the guy. And I, I don't say which guy's coming up. And one guy gives a punch, one guy gives a <laughs> one guy, oh, one guy gives a chop, another guy gives a throw, another guy does a takedown, another guy shoves a guy. You know, we you know we're doing this, right? Then I say, okay, thank you. I ask my volunteers to sit down. I take the blindfold off of the uh, uh, volunteer and I say, what style hits you first? Oh, what style uh, shoved you second? Or kicked you third? Or what style did this or this? Nobody can answer the question. Uh, some people tried. Oh, that was a oh, taekwondo. You know, it, you know, kinetic energy transfer. It, it's not like a glass of wine. Oh, here's a bottle of wine I, I, and a glass. And the label is covered up. I don't know where it's from. But I pour the wine, I can look at the color, you know, I, I can swirl it around and I can, you know, and, I, and then I can, I can nose it, you know, and then I can have a taste. And I, oh, that's a Mendoza wine. I know it. I, I can tell you, 2018 Mendoza, whatever. You can't do that with kinetic energy. You get hit, boom, and you either know how to make the kinetic energy transfer, or you don't, it's as simple as that. 
So the focus of attention for me became exclusively functionality. Are you functionally competent or not? But you see, when I talk like that, a lot of people get insulted because they think I'm targeting them or a style or something. I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm merely saying, if you're teaching a tradition and you're using the word self-protection, okay, so if, if, if you're using it as a sport, no problem. Rules, regulations dictate the outcomes and the training methodologies to accomplish, no problem. Uh, if you're doing it as a lifestyle, no problem. You know, lifestyle, uh, it depends uh, how far down the pathway you get before it becomes evident that destination's not the goal. It's the journey, a lifestyle. No, I have no problem with that. If, you, if, if, if it's a business for you, I mean, it's been a business for the Japanese and the Chinese for, you know, well, it's okay to be a business. I used to think it was the oldest business at one time. Then I realized, oh, it's not the oldest business. That's a joke. And then I realized, okay, it can also be a form of physical fitness, mental well-being. I have no problem with that. But if you're going to say, I'm teaching karate as a form of self-protection, well, I want to know, is what you're teaching functionally comp? In other words, will it help defend you against real acts of physical violence? It, it fell quietly dormant. So we had to research, cross-train, look in all the nooks and crannies, read all the old books, go to the, you know, in my day, there wasn't the internet. I had to go to China. I had to go to Fujian. I had to go to Guangdong, Hong Kong, Formosa, Taiwan, Korea, Saudi. I had to go to these places, meet these authorities of various traditions and train with them hands on. Ask the questions, be gentle, be a little bit more sensitive than I am right now to be able to create a, uh, a, a, a baseline upon which to better understand and make my deductions. Because all progress is only ever made by the taking of careful measurements. And I want to close this part with a quote from Miyagi Chuojin. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think I think I was the first person to translate this and introduce it into the Western world. I stand to be corrected, but I don't know anybody before me. In the Kankan Toyama published uh, in his work, uh, the meeting of the Okinawan masters that happened in 1936. And uh, in, part of the, in part of the meeting, and you know all the people who were at the meeting, we know them all. and. Um, uh, Miyagi Chojin was asked a question by uh, Ota Chofu. Ota Chofu, he, he's another guy, in my opinion, very important for karate, by the way, but we'll talk about him later. Ota Chofu says to Miyagi Chojin, so I, I hear now there's, there's also a lot of styles in karate. And Miyagi, Miyagi thinks about it for a minute and he goes, you know, I heard that. And I heard, you know, because now we know there's uh, at least two streams that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, one stream comes in from here and another stream comes from here. You know, this could be the Shodin or the Shode, you know, different streams. But from what I know and what I've seen, I have to say, if there's any difference between the styles, it's only because of different ways of teaching the same thing. You, you are amazing, Gabriel. You're, you're, uh, I just, you, you have to forgive me because the whole side of my screen is, uh, 
many people are asking questions, you know, and uh, I'm trying to respond to the questions by typing. And about about 10 people are saying, what a fantastic job you're doing. It's, uh, I agree, it's fantastic here. Wow. I know what it's like to translate, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, to, to listen, to make notes, then to give the uh, explanation. It's not easy to do. And uh, to be precise, it's, uh, it's an art. So thank you. Thank you very much. No, nothing that we can do uh, can be enough, uh, Hanshi, uh, to thank you. Uh, because you can't imagine what an honor it's for us to have you here today. Look, uh, yes, yes. that's why I like that uh, term, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, uh, Isaac Newton's quote, because uh, uh, we, we, all of us here uh, are like-minded people. We all going in the same direction, maybe at different, maybe at different parts, different pathways, all going the same way. And the, the beautiful thing about what we're doing is I'm 100% sure I could be sitting here listening to you or listening to Shihan or, or, or listening to uh, uh, any of the senior teachers telling me about your experiences. That's the beauty. That's the beauty about what we, what it is we do. And that's, that's the beauty about, uh, and that's why I love this part of the art, not the sport. I, I'm not down on the sport. Love I, did the sport for 25, I, no problem. But it's a highly competitive adversarial methodology, which doesn't always bring out the best in everybody, especially at the time. But this art form, you, you could just be walking anywhere in the world, bump into somebody and uh, they practice karate, you're talking and the next thing you know, it's three hours later, oh God, I missed my flight or, because we're all very passionate about this type of thing. And everybody has a different uh, understanding of the same thing that brings us together. And every time that is shared, we can't help but have a, a, a better understanding of what that particular issue means. Can I just, get, I know Pimentel Sensei wants to give it. I, can I just say one, one little thing? So, so, uh, so some years ago, I'm in Texas teaching a seminar, and um, great, great group of people, by the way. And, you know, anyway, uh, my host says to me, "Oh, this guy uh, came wants to interview you today." And I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. Anyway, blah blah blah. We do the interview, and I say to him later, I said, "How did you enjoy the practice?" Ah, fantastic. <laughs> I've never seen this type of karate before. Uh, your, your, your applications, wow, I, I love it. And, okay, yeah. so I say to him, would you like to learn some more? Oh, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good. And I went, you, because me, I'm the constant uh, beginner, you know, I'm, I'm always learning. I. I you know, I, I just got to learn from everybody, you know, and I'm always looking for more refined ways to do the same thing, better and more penetrating explanations, clearer uh, understandings, you know, that type of thing. So when he said to me, oh, yes, wow, fantastic. I've never seen that before. But no, I don't want to practice any. I said, why not? And here's what he said to me. He said, well, I go to the dojo. Um, I, you know, I've been going, I've been going to the same dojo for more than 25 years. I line up. We kneel down, do zazen. We bow, we stand up. We do a little warm up. We do kihon waza. We do some yakusoku kumite. And then if they break off to do, uh, you know, ju kumite, I go over in the back and I work with the beginners. You know, at my age, he said, I don't want to do that anymore. And then when that's finished, we come back, we do group kata together. Then we do a nice, you know, city undo cool down. Then we do some zazen meditation and the class is over. We go for a beer. I'm happy with that. 
I never thought of that before. It makes perfect sense. What a great thing to do. But I, I never thought of that because I'm always trying to learn more and, you know, strengthen what I know. And may, is there a better way of looking at it, you know? And, and, and so let me just support that with this last thing. I know a gentleman, a British, British, a British gentleman, he lives in Japan. He's lived in Japan for much of his life. I even tell you his name. His name is Steve Bellamy. I'm in a conversation one day with Steve Bellamy. He's very senior, much senior than me in martial arts. But he used to also practice karate. Now he only does a koru, you know, Joel. So. But I said to myself, Steve, why don't you practice karate anymore? And he practiced Goju Kai by the, with the Yamaguchi, Goju, Goju Kai, not, not Goju, Goju Kai. And he said, I, why don't I practice? Because I learned it. And I said, because in my mind, I'm thinking karate, lifetime study, you know, I'm going to practice it forever, you know. And, you know, maybe the way I did it when I was young is not the same way I do it now. And when I get old, maybe I'm already old, but you know, maybe the way I do it when I'm old is not the same as I do it when I'm young, but it's going to be for life. But Steve said to me, no, I, I learned it. I, I was very confused. I said, what do you mean you learned it? And he said, do you drive a car? Yeah, of course, everybody drives a car. How did you learn to drive the car? I took lessons, you know, I, I yeah, but, I, but who, who gave you the license? I said, well, I took a test. Did you pass the test? Yes. Did you get the license? Yes. What does the license say? It says I can drive a car. Exactly. That's my point. I learned karate. I now know karate. I don't need to practice it anymore. Uh, he's very fit and very healthy, by the way, from his other martial art. You know. But he said to me, I learned it. I, I learned how to defend myself. What else do I need to do? So, so the guy who interviewed me in Dallas, Texas, God rest his soul, he, he passed away now, and Steve Bellamy, they, they provided for me two different perspectives that I never thought of. I never thought of that. Who thought of that? But I had to respect it. It's not the way I think, but I had to respect that that's the way some people think about what it is that brings us together. And that's the fascinating part about this. Everybody thinks about the same thing differently. And it's not a good thing or it's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. And the more that we open our minds and open our hearts and use love rather than fear as a mechanism to connect with other people, you wind up getting this type of thing. It's, it's a magic thing. The dojo is where, where science and art come together to create a magic. And that's, I'm sure all of you feel the same way about this. It's this magic and, and understanding our history, our, the mythology, the philosophy, the spiritual essence, the pedagogical part, the holistic part, that really gives us the texture of the art so that we realize we don't all have to be doing the same thing the same way. And that's the beauty about art. And I think that whenever someone says, no, it has to be this way, I think that's when you need to run. May I then say something? Any more questions? Sure. Ready to go? Oh. Okay, can you hear me? Sure, who's that? Okay, Eric. Eric Rodriguez. From Brazil, here. 
Just, uh, I gotta find you on this. Oh, where are you? Wait, okay. wave, wave your hand so I can see you. Here, here. Ah, there you go. Sorry, <laughs> Hannah, I got you. Good. Okay. okay. <laughs> Live long and prosper, uh, brother. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, the thing is, I would like to thank you because, you get, you know, as I said in the comments session, you gave us so much food for thought that uh, you take some weeks to digest everything. Uh, and um, now I cannot do it because my dream is kind of researching about martial arts and karate more, more deeply. Even going abroad, if it's possible, I, I know we have internet nowadays, but going there is a kind of different feeling. So I'm, I'm even kind of studying a bit of Japanese to understand better the things. And the thing I like the most about your exhibition uh, is what I think that sometimes when you want to understand something, maybe you shouldn't uh, be uh, looking direct to the thing, but look into the surroundings, what is happening around the things. And then you understand the relations with society. Because I have many friends here that practice karate. And when they talk about karate, they, they talk about karate and martial arts as something uh, alone in their universe. They do not see the connections about the society and the culture itself and the history and then what happened. So uh, I, I always thought there's something missing here. I want to research more. And then when I, I, I heard uh, all your speech today, many things connected, even with my uh, experiences in my, in my life. For example, when you, when you talked about applications uh, being functional, I remember when I was a kid, I didn't know anything about Taekwondo, karate or anything. But we, as a kid, we were watching movies and we tried to fight each other and we were learning by ourselves how to do things without having any classes. And we were like, kind of, let's say, creating a way of fighting and have some function to protect ourselves against each other. So that's the, that's the thing. So everything is connecting here. So thank you pretty much for this, for this lesson today. And uh, I'm sure that it would be very useful to everyone that is open to... to uh, not uh, not romanticizing karate or martial arts anymore. Like not uh, stuck in a in a closed mindset and uh, open our minds to to see how things really goes. And uh, and also not looking only to the the movement itself, but where they came from and why and how to use them. Of course, music, I have a lot of things. Sorry? Music, music to my ears, my friend. Thank you for caring and yeah. sharing. I I could we could we could talk for hours just on what yeah. you just said. hours yeah. you know and, I would you know love especially to. I would love to. especially the part about where it came from and how it got to be the way it is that deserves a whole you know whenever we get back around again you know it's like T Thomas Stern's Elliot you know my one of my favorite playwrights back at you know he said that we'll never cease from exploration but at the end we arrive back at where we started to know it for the very first time and that's that thing about you know that circle of learning you know the the shuhari you know the the to learn from tradition to break the chains of tradition to transcend the tradition just to end up back at the doorstep of tradition again you know and just do it all over again and again and again, and again. that's the beautiful part about that thank you mr mccarthy thank you very much i have to take off We'll, uh, we'll be on here next next Saturday if you want to join us for sure. We'll leave it up to Gabriel and Mr. Pimental. I'm happy to, I'm always happy to participate. There's so much to talk about. Well, Sanchi, uh, thank you very much for your for kind uh, teachings and uh, I hope to learn a, a lot more. And um, uh, you know, you have a house here in Spain and nice to see you again, sir. Thank you, brother. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Francis Patrick McCarthy. Makotoni, arigato gozaimashita. Kontani, Oh, yeah, thank you. 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 考えて、えっと、ハンガリーについて、あの、僕はハンガリー全然わからないんですけども、でも僕のトランスレーターはちょっとその次はあの休みですけども、はい、はい。頭の中なんの今日何するの。彼女はえっと、顔は日本人です
、えっ、ー、と、なんだろう、ね、日本人、あの、沖縄かと思いますね。はい、彼女は、あの、先生、あ、マッカシ先生、えー、例えば、あの、ちょっと。えー、英語は、まだあまり上手じゃないんですけれども、えー、日本語とハングレー、語、ペルペルですけど。そう、もしできれば、ちょっと、<笑>あの、日本の質問あるんですけれども、あの。翻訳したあのー、そ,そしたら説明あるんですけどもあのあびっくりしましたやっぱりねその時にあの他の人は<笑> Hey why are you speaking Japanese in、uh, Hungary I said and I said to them I said well <laughs> because my English translator is not here and the only girl is that Japanese girl the father's、uh, Hungarian and la 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 and so we did the whole seminar In Japanese and Hungarian, and, and the, some guy I forgot, some guy asked me to send us some Facebook、uh, hello or something. And the guy goes, That guy's a really weird guy, man. He's like in Hungary talking Japanese. I just don't figure it out. So, Bikri, I know, yeah, but so, I know, Mimi, I know, Natsugasi, this year, don't know. Natsugasi, thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Hola a todos.、Eh, hola, Sensei. Hello, Sensei.、Eh, yes,、uh, como ha dicho Patrick McCarthy,、eh, bueno, si tenéis algún tipo de duda sobre lo que es el Coluchinadi,、eh, la organización y RKRS,、eh, por favor, me podéis escribir a mí personalmente. Yo voy a poner ahí un correo mío también、eh, de electrónico si me queréis contactar. Y igualmente será un placer. Vale. It's my pleasure, really. Gracias, Gabriel. Ha sido una traducción espectacular la que has hecho hoy.、Eh, te lo digo en nombre mía y, y de Hanshi McCarthy. It's been an extraordinary translation what you've done today and very accurate.、Uh, has hecho una traducción muy, muy exacta. Y bueno, es un poco la razón por la que estoy aquí también. <laughs> It's also the reason why I'm here.、Uh, eh, ha sido un placer. Bueno,、eh, agradezco infinitamente el paso de Gabriel. Después de estas palabras y estas reflexiones, yo creo que lo mío va a ser este, insignificante, dado la profundidad de las expresiones de Hans. Lo único que puedo decir es que este, el tono del relato, el cual he escuchado, me invita emocionalmente a viajar contigo, estimado amigo y maestro. Este, no hace falta que te invitemos a este. A este foro, e s tu casa, porque ha quedado mucha gente con ganas de preguntar, dado que con una sola pregunta has desarrollado un mundo y una prolífica exposición de tus emociones, de tus experiencias, y que generosamente nos has hecho compartir, y que cuando te invitamos no sabía que ibas a hacer menos e s t mucho más rica, y que creo que te has invitado a una segunda posibilidad. Quizás este. Le podamos dar más oportunidad a la gente para que se sienta más partícipe en cuanto a que este, pueda preguntar algo más. Pero bueno, es un, es un tema a posterior a rellenar. Desde ya queremos, cada uno de los que estamos acá, agradecer que nos hayas hecho viajar desde tu vasta y interminable experiencia, las hayas compartido tan generosamente con nosotros y que nos haya hecho ver lo que el maestro Quindio siempre me dijo: aquí no hay estilos. Lo que sí hay son espíritus que navegan de un lado al otro a través de la forma, pero los espíritus s i e n d o los mismos. Muchas gracias, querido amigo, hermano y maestro. Desde Argentina, desde este lugar, desde Sudamérica, de toda esta gente que está participando, agradecemos tu generosa exposición. Para vos, mi agradecimiento y el de todos. Sí, mi hermano, mi sensei, mi a m i g o We are, I am so in, infinitely thankful.、Uh, my words, anything that I can say, is absolutely insignificant compared with the richness of your words.、Uh, thank you very much, dear Hanshi, for accepting this invitation. But to tell you the truth, this is not an invitation because this forum is your home. We can't. Understand sometimes that with just one question, you generally see enrich us 
with all this knowledge. There are a lot of participants that uh, would like to ask you, that would like to get your knowledge and to learn from your teachings. Hope someday we will have the opportunity, you will give us the opportunity of having you again. So not me, because you know, I am already done. I'm so lucky that I already had the opportunity to meet you and hope to meet you again soon. But many participants don't have this opportunity. And the main goal of this forum is to give the chance to those which, who don't have these chances uh, to meet you in person and to uh, grow up uh, from your teachings. Uh, so hope someday to have you back. And um, thank you very much for uh, giving us a trip today. We, we had the opportunity of flying to the past and flying through the continents uh, with the teachings. Uh, today we had with us people from all over the world, mainly a lot of people from Latin America that are so thankful uh, of having this historical opportunity of learning from your teachings. Hanshi, my dear friend, my dear brother, you can't imagine how important you are for us. Thank you very much today for joining us. So Hanshi, oh, I are. suggest we give a big applause to our dear Hanshi. Such a great honor having you today, dear Hanshi. Well, again, thank you so much, everybody. I love you all. Oh.